Good morning, Word of Life. Welcome to a special edition of Sunday morning worship with us here today. Um, why is it so special? Well, because today is CLB Sunday, um, a chance for us to join with other Lutheran Brethren churches across the country in hearing the same message. Now, today the sermon is going to be brought by Pastor Paul Larson, who is the president of the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. Now, some of you may not know or may not be aware uh, that Word of Life is a, a part of a greater family of churches across uh, the U.S. and Canada. There's, there's over a hundred of them um, called the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. Now, these churches, much like Word of Life, are, are committed and driven by sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus um, with everyone that can hear it. Um, and it's in that same spirit of, of preaching the gospel that we join together uh, as a family of churches uh, today on, on Sunday, August 9th, um, to hear the same message together. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Church of the Lutheran Brethren, you can head over to our website, wordoflifemn.com, and uh, you'll see some more resources and links available to you there. Now, because of the various um, kind of technical difficulties that we have here at the church um, that don't allow us to play live video um, in the worship center and also live video um, live streaming here on Facebook and YouTube, um, that's why we're kind of doing this format. Um, but don't worry, uh, we will be back live streaming um, from the worship center with Pastor Jay next Sunday, August 16th. Um, in the meantime, I would like to read our call to worship from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. It says this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, let's toss it over to President Larson, bringing God's word for our national body of churches here today on COB Sunday. Enjoy the message. Be reminded of how much God absolutely loves you this morning. And word of life, go in peace. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. I love water. I love the look and the sound of, of water. I love to paddle it, swim it, sail it, snorkel it, ride the waves of it. However, sadly, water seems not to always love me. When it comes to water, I have the buoyancy of a rock, frankly. Too many stories, too little time, but let's just say I've known more than a few times that sinking feeling. Peter, in our Pericope Gospel text, knew something of that sinking feeling, didn't he? Petros, who by namesake literally had the buoyancy of a rock, endeavored to walk on the waves of a turbulent, stormy sea, and yet lived to tell us the story of the one who stretched down his arm to save him. You know what it is to have that sinking feeling. In some way, sure, you do. We all do. And don't we all, dear church brothers and sisters of the Church of the Lutheran Brethren, in this rogue wave of a year called 2020, feel ourselves 
in a storm. We look out at the, at the whip and roar of, of waves and the storm around us and wonder if we'll stay afloat or if we'll sink. Fear and chaos, division and insecurity, our nation, our communities, and the church look different than anything we've ever seen. And it's hard to know what to cling to and where to bravely plant our foot of faith next. And if we can see any familiar land to make sure for. That sinking feeling of the virus and violence, of statements, some vital, many ad nauseum, of silence, cowardly and sometimes brave, of diversity and unity, racism, reconciliation, love, hatred, religious freedom, restraint, systemic, oh, plenty of systemic to go around, not least of all, systemic opinion, masks, schools, jobs, politics, election, chaos, agenda, and so many narratives, profuse as the waves themselves. And who knows if you ride and, and join one where you land. And every home and congregation and community and state and region and every person, their own context with past important defining histories and real and present experiences. It's quite a storm. Tell me about it. My daughter's godmother, a, a pastor's wife in a Hispanic congregation in California, a good friend of ours, has been in critical care in a hospital battling COVID-19. My cousin's wife in Michigan succumbed to the virus. Like you, I have had such swirling questions, cautions about statistics and reports and treatments and tactics. My other daughter is just past being a rookie cop. I'm very proud and a little concerned. And yes, absolutely. The lives of my brown and black neighbors matter, period. They matter to me and, and might I better lay down my life for them. As blessed as I've been, I've not often cared as much for the blessing and care of my neighbor as Luther says I should in his explanation of the fifth and seventh commandments, whatever their skin, however they vote, whatever signs my neighbor plants in his yard, nor I'm sure have I duly cared for and laid down my life for the saving of my unborn neighbor, or for that matter, even my racist neighbor, because there are no new sins in my neighborhood and no worse sin or sinner under the sun or no worse sin or sinner in this storm who less needs or more or less deserves the outstretched arm of Jesus. And my neighbor's greatest guilt is also mine. For I killed Jesus. I nailed the innocent Son of God to the cross. Look into this story, this scriptural story with me briefly today, church. Look into this storm in this text and of our time and look at this Savior and look at this disciple, Peter. I, I want us to focus our attention on the two great movements in this story. First, is verses 22 through 27 as Jesus in the storm walks on the water. And the second movement is verses 28 through 33 as Peter would walk on that water. After the feeding of the 5,000 meal, Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him across the Sea of Galilee. In the eight or nine or so hours from the end of dinner time to now just shortly before dawn, in verse 25, we see the disciples have made slow progress across the Sea of Galilee. We're told in another gospel that they've gone a mere three to three and a half miles. They're, they're halfway, they're literally halfway across the lake, but verse 24 says the wind has been against them. In other words, paradoxically, catch this, their best effort in this storm, their greatest sweat, their best solution have all landed them in the most vulnerable spot smack in the middle of the lake, furthest from the shore, in the middle of a huge storm. The verse 24 says they have been buffeted by the waves. The word means to batter or to test as with the refining of metal. It carries within it even the sense of the idea of testing even by torture to find out what's truly inside something or someone, what they know, what they believe. A storm is like that, isn't it? They test our metal. Under such stress and distress, under such pain and fear, they reveal who we are. Like some sanctioned circumstantial version of 
spiritual interrogation. They show what we believe. What we know comes out. I know some of you. Some of your stories. You are in the storm. It is testing your mettle. Refining your faith. There is a sanctioned interrogation. A buffeting trial for you and others to know what's inside you. What you know and believe. I know for some of our congregations and pastors. This has been a long, hard row, hasn't it? Jesus has been praying for you. In this story, this first movement, Jesus comes out to his disciples walking on the water. Notice the threefold response of Jesus' disciples when they see him. First of all, they're terrified. It's, the word has the sense of being unsettled. The storm is as if it has moved inside a, a, of them. They are unsettled. Second, they have this kind of anti-confession. Rather than saying it's Christ, they say it's a ghost. Like their boat turns into this Scooby-Doo mystery machine. It, it's a ghost. They see a ghost. Isn't it ironic, tragically so, that in the middle of the storm, in this unexplainable mystery, but, but surely the supernatural has come near, followers of Jesus would sooner be superstitious to presume a haunting evil than conceive that good news is advancing to them through the storm in Christ and is near? You know, it's probably important to recognize two important little narratives going on here. The sea in ancient times... And in scripture, especially in storm, is seen as a place divided from, separated from God and representing evil. And we can get that. The sea's power, unharnessed, dangerous, swallowing, deadly. A sea separates God's people in slavery from freedom. The sea is where unseen danger lurks, where Jesus sends demons from people into pigs to plunge into the abyss, where Jonah is swallowed whole. It was the superstition of sailors in ancient times that just before they died in a storm, it was believed they would see a ghost. But the other narrative that runs counter to this is again and again and again present in the Old Testament. It is pictured that this wild, dangerous, unwieldy force of water, especially in storm, can only be tamed by God. Only God can deliver from the stormy sea, and he does. He is the one to roll back the Red Sea. In numerous Old Testament passages, God is said, is seen to rule the fomenting waves. Habakkuk 3.15 says of God, you trample the sea. I love how in Job 9.8, Job says of God, he alone, listen, treads on the waves of the sea. And so when Jesus comes walking across the water, it's a statement of deity. So which is it going to be, disciples of Jesus, in the boat in this tempestuous storm? As this figure walks toward you in this storm, do you expect to meet the worst of your superstitious fears? Will evil haunt you in this storm? Or will you by faith fully expect and believe and rejoice that the only one who can tame and walk the waves is a holy God and our Savior Christ who has indeed come walking the waves across this storm and good news has come next to you. Well, obviously they chose curtain one. And so the third response from them is they cry out in fear. But notice how Jesus immediately, that's three times in this story, verses 22, 27, 31. In, in Matthew, this word immediately, a theo marks something important, dramatic, about to happen in God's clear attention and intention to care immediately it see it says Jesus matches their threefold faithless response to his presence and so first of all to their unsettled spiritual seasickness inner turmoil he says take courage apparently in Christ who knew it bon courage it, it's available to us courage and and secondly Jesus gives this monumental imperial identification of himself it is I. Much is made of this and should be. Our time is short, but basically Jesus here is echoing as a New Testament Greek version of the Old Testament statement, Yahweh claim of God, of his divinity. As in Exodus 3, when to Moses he says, I am, here in the Greek, ego eimi, it is I. It is I. That, that miracle of feeding 5,000 people back there, this walking on the water, 
It's no magician. It's no ghost. This is me, and I am God. By the way, in the, in the resolution of this story, in verse 33, we see two extraordinary things in these pious Jewish monotheistic sailors. First of all, they worship him. Never would a Jew worship a mere man. And secondly, they say for the first time confessed in the Gospels by disciples. The Father has said it already at Jesus' baptism in chapter 3. Demons have blurted it out in chapter 8. But for the first time, here the disciples confess, surely you are the Son of God. And in Jesus' response to the threefold response of his disciples, he says, take courage, it is I. And then to their cry of fear, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Again, don't miss this. Our, our Christian culture, so, so terrorized by the storm, so seemingly helpless before fear, apparently in Christ, fear can be surrendered to him. Jesus says this about anxiety and fear. It's not like, stop that, stop it, but it's more like, let me have it. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Act one is complete in our story. What a great word for our time. The, the story could end there except Peter. Oh, Peter. Act two. He says in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you out on the water. All this that Jesus has given courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Somehow it's not enough for Peter. It's rather amazing, really, the, the gall of this young fisherman to say to the one before him, having divinely walked on the water, having fed the 5,000, having revealed himself time and again as the one Peter follows, having addressed each of the disciples' needs for calm, for faith, for relief from fear, Peter still has the audacity to say, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. What a sign of sin in Peter and of us all in this storm. You know, Peter really has two problems here. First of all, Peter does not consider Jesus' word enough. He does not consider Jesus' claim, Jesus' promise, identity, Jesus' saving solution enough of nature, nor do I. Not good enough. I want more. I want more proof. I, I want power and a plan I approve of. But his second problem then is Peter comes up with a solution for his wavering faith, and it's not even logical. If he believes the Son of God standing on the water in the storm before him might really be a haunting ghost or powerful demon, how does his walking on the water prove anything different, right? Yet Peter's proud, though incongruent, request does reveal this one thing about all of us who are little in faith during a storm. Whatever we might find somehow deficient in Christ, we seek the supplement and the heroic solution to somehow be something about me. Right? How telling. But this endeavor of Peter's is short-lived. He gets out of the boat. Jesus has already come to him. He's near, but Peter takes a, just a couple steps toward Jesus, and that is a miracle. But then, verse 30, he saw the wind. He saw the effects of the wind, actually. The rocking of the waves, the rocking boat, the splash, the spray, the howl of the wind, the black churn of the water. Everything is heaving, moving, bobbing, except Jesus. And it hits Peter, that sinking feeling. His vulnerability is too great. His faith is too small. The danger around him, the fear, the panic sets in. Have you ever panicked in water? All the swirl of the storm, of the virus, of the violence around us. And he begins to sink. You see, in the storm, it's not that Peter didn't have faith. It's that his faith did not hold its focus. How like us, how like me in a storm. It's kind of like the secret of tightrope walking. You must never look down or around you, but always have your eyes fixed on the destination. There's an old story retold many times about a Hasidic rabbi in one of the gulag prison camps of Stalinist Siberia. And in rabbinic fashion, he set out to know the stories of those in the camp with him, believing that each person had something to be learned from. And he found one man who, before his imprisonment, had been a high-wire tightrope walker. And one day after Stalin had died and the troops had relaxed their rules, the prisoners put on a variety show, a kind of circus to entertain each other, and this rabbi watched this man string a rope high off the ground. He fell once, but he said like a cat, got right back up on the wire and, and walked, and then even 
danced his way to the claps of the crowd across the high wire and back again. Later, the rabbi approached and asked the tightrope walker, what is the secret to your art? What does one need to master? Balance, stamina, concentration? The tightrope walker's answer surprised him. The secret is always keeping your destination in focus. You have to keep your eyes on the other end of the rope. But do you know what the hardest part is? When you get to the middle, the rabbi ventured. No, said the tightrope walker. It's when you make the turn. Because for a fraction of a second, if you lose sight of your destination, when you don't have sight of your destination, that is when you are most likely to fall. The secret is always keeping your destination in focus. And, and here in is the landing point of the story of the storm and impetuous Peter. In the end, it's not that Peter had little faith, but that he had any faith. When Peter's about to sink, struggling to keep faith's focus as he is still, there is enough faith to cry out, Lord, save me. And in verse 31, here's this word again. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Immediately, he reached out. He stretched out. The word is used repeatedly in the New Testament. Fourteen times we see Jesus extending himself, his arms to heal, to save, to rescue. It's a foreshadowment even of the cross. And it's so fitting that the saving action here is not Peter reaching up through the surf to Jesus, but Jesus plunging through burial waters and by his saving action alone through the water raises this helpless one of only minimal faith from sure death to sure life. And Jesus says, even before getting in the boat, there still in the wet spray, he says just this, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I love this. Actually, uh, the words are, are, are filled in here in our translation, our English translation. All Jesus here really says is just the adjective oligopistos. Uh, it's almost like a descriptive nickname, like calling somebody shorty. Jesus calls this anti-buoyant Petros almost a, a, a new second nickname. He calls him Little Faith. And in this storm, he might say the same to us. Little Faith, why do you doubt? For the revelation of this storm, in the end, is not primarily the insufficiency of Peter to believe, but it is to show the all-sufficiency of Jesus to save. Isn't that good news? Was there ever a man who was less deserving of rescue than Peter? If Christ could reach and save him, do you not think even with your little faith he would gladly reach down and save you? Oh, all you little faiths in my hearing, Jesus is calling, reaching to you even in this storm. Your faith may be weak, your distractions, fears, angers, confusions, opinions, many. But if you will receive the faith in him, he extends to you his salvation, the stretching out of his arm all the way from Calvary through this storm to save you from your sin, all your sins, even of doubt and disbelief, the smallest faith, the weakest faith when placed in the sure love and sheer saving power of Jesus. It is enough. And above all that we hear, colorful, impetuous, opinionated, verbose Peter all we hear him say in all the Gospels, above all that his mates in the boat hear him say, or crowds on the shore have heard him blurt out above the din of all the noise, all the statements and stands and symbolic gestures coming from people like Peter in the church today, some of them very important and necessary. But above all, may our voice, our witness, never be less or other than this. Never be clear what we need, what our neighbor needs, what this world and this storm needs. May the voice of this gospel call and that soul attachment of faith and that voice of witness and rescue for every one of our neighbors never be lost in the din of other words. So if there is one word, one call that must not be lost, that must always unite us, must be our surest, loudest, clearest confession. May it be this soul unified confession of faith that attaches us to Jesus and his outstretched arms. Lord, save me.